<laughs> wow, all right, it. yeah. I, like <laughs> I would prefer that for sure, but I know I want to do that. I don't do that. <laughs> it's better actually with the, than the laser because it creates a shadow and they're therefore better you know, when it you're is. pointing at things. And you, then you can use it on a variety of different stuff. So go ahead. You, you, I'm ready. ready. Yep. Oh, yeah. Just, Good afternoon, everybody. This is a uh, restoration seminar, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Robert Moller, who is our next speaker on the series. And uh, we just, Robert is actually visiting you quite uh, frequently. I just met him on that public uh, meeting uh, in the mining, mining City Center, and they did a great job, uh, I believe, on just giving all their information for the public. But today, Robert is talking on something I believe he did in the past, too, and he's kind of thinking it over. Uh, and I would like to introduce first him. Uh, so Robert Mueller joined the Environmental Protection Agency as a community involvement coordinator for the Superfront Unit in the Helena, Montana office in 2015. He is a returning East Corps volunteer and a veteran of the U.S. Army. Robert has a bachelor's degree in communication and a master's degree in forestry. In his public service career, Robert has worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in California, the Natural Resource Conservation Service in Montana, and the Peace Corps uh, in Ghana and Vanuatu. I hope I pronounced yeah, that. You did. Good job. Um, so welcome. And no, thanks. Looking forward to your talk. Today. I'm also uh, here with uh, the greater part of my family, uh, Michelle, my wife, my three kids, Rice, Sage, and Sylvie. So hey, I want to say thanks of all for inviting me uh, to provide this uh, seminar. And I want to take valuable use of your time. I know that we have about 50 minutes. So I'd like to cover community involvement kind of in general and maybe start to relate it how it in relates to restoration and uh, why do we do it and how do we do it and what are some good methods and then what I'd like to do is share a little bit of my experiences involving communities in restoration activities and then at the end I hope to be able to open it up and, and learn from you your perspectives uh, especially as we do community involvement work here in Butte because you are a community in Butte uh, and you can be involved in the super fun process uh, that's part of the EPA. Are um, these plant communities you're talking about or are they <laughs> communities uh, of, of people? People, for people communities. Uh, though they're very interrelated with the plant communities. Thank you, the ecological communities, and I want to talk about that. And then I want to take a little special emphasis, just because we have Dr. Ray in the room, to talk about uh, environmental justice and reaching underserved, low income, and uh, other communities like that, uh, which is applicable here, as you will see in my presentation, also applicable uh, in different parts of the world. So, first of all, community involvement involves involving the community. So right now my community is this classroom and I'm going to ha ask you some questions. Uh, how do you define a community and what does community involvement mean? You see how sometimes challenging community involvement can be? <laughs> and there's lots of different methods we can use to involve communities. Uh, but uh, I will be asking you questions so you know think about what I'm saying and, and I really do want to learn your, your perspectives. Uh, here, but uh, communities, they can be different kinds of communities. We, there's different tools to assess what a community is like, but ultimately I, I kind of like this, this kind of three-tiered approach to de defining what a community might be. This is not comprehensive by any means, but there's a community of place. What do you think that means? Physical, Physical place. So in Butte, the community of Butte is the, the, the community of place there. But you know, when involving communities, you can't stop there. You think, well, it's in Butte. Superfund's in Butte for this project. We just have to look to Butte. That's just not so. We have uh, communities of value. What do you think that might be? Uh, ideals. Ideals. Uh, yeah, what, what, are, what are people ideal? So I might not live in Butte, but I have a value of environmental restoration. I have a value of keeping my environment clean. And so I can be a stakeholder in that, even though I'm not living there. 
We also have a community of identity. This is different from value because you can have this share an identity with somebody, but you don't necessarily share their values, you don't necessarily share their places. So somebody give me an example of what a community of identity might look like. Because part of the trick, oh, go ahead. National heritage. Okay, your national heritage, absolutely. We can uh, uh, identify with uh, de the demographics that we represent. I'm a Polish American, I've got some Irish, you know, there's some very real heritage that way. There's also, you will be, many of you, I hope, will be alumni of the Mon University of Montana Technical Institute. You'll carry that with you for the rest of your life. You may have inv you may be invested as alumni in the things going on here, even though you're working on an engineering project somewhere else in the world. And we want to be able to make sure that we tap into those communities, too, because community reach and involvement in a project is important. Why? Why is understanding the community people and getting them in part of a restoration or any other kind of project really important? To get some feedback from the population nearby so Absolutely. we can really enjoy the project right. and restore what needs to be restored. Excellent. So they will not complain afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, yes. No, absolutely. So yeah, basically what he's saying is you, you want to be listening to that community because in that listening to the community, you can not only identify what those needs are, whether they're restoration or other development needs, uh, but you're sharing information. They can tell you important things on how to reach other communities and uh, what priorities there might be and get their involvement so that they're a part of it and they might support it. Now, you need support in some projects. Because restoration costs money, it costs time, it costs labor. And the more you get communities involved, the more you can leverage your partnerships to ensure that you're accessing you know, that community support. And it also builds a sense of identity. Now, we'll take a snapshot of Butte back and forth right now, but right now, the Butte situation, there's not a lot of community identity in the Superfund issues. That's one of the issues that we hopefully uh, I'll ask help from you that we can, some strategies on maybe how we can improve that. But in other areas, if, you, if you're identified with the project, you don't want it to fail. You want it to be good, and you're more apt to be motivated and not complain about it, like you said, when, when we're going through it. It's very important. So that's kind of like why we want to. And I, you know, there's a lot of reasons, and I, I just, we're short on time. We only have 50 minutes, but I, I want to make sure that we cover all of our bases. Uh, but we can't stop there. It's, it sounds like a good idea. There's all these different communities that might be relevant. In Butte, there's different communities. In Vanuatu, there's different communities. In Ghana, there's different communities. In Montana, there's different communities. We know why we need to get their support. Academia communities, low-income communities, elected official communities. But how do we do that? Yeah, that's all said. Yeah, the assessment's kind of easy. What we need to do, how do you do it? You give them some way to participate. Right. Absolutely. Participation is key. In fact, what you're looking at is some one micro part of what is EPA's Comprehensive Outreach and Engagement Strategy in Butte, this class. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about Dr. Powell's project and what we're doing in terms of community involvement. But situations, it might be just information sharing. And a lot of community and, and to, to participate you want to make sure that you're sharing information, not just I'm telling you, but collect that information to find out what those priorities and those development needs are. What do we want to restore? How do we want to restore it? And what are our challenges? So they've got to be participating. And we can do a variety of different methods. You can have public meetings. In the Peace Corps, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, there was certain frameworks that we'd use. And we used, as a volunteer, something called PACA. And that's participatory. Uh, Boy, pocket. What is it for for uh, participatory for community action appraisal? Community participatory appraisal for community action, and this was a framework that you could use to go out and not only identify the relevant communities, find out who they are, but do participatory projects to get them involved to identify what do you think your needs are. Well, we need a truck. Okay. Well, why do you need a truck? Well, we need to mu move our our crops. Well, why do you need to move your crops? We need to get them processed. Having that kind of uh, input is really valuable to be able to identify, how, and that's involvement right there, but then identify where you can actually take action to improve you know, what you need to improve, whether it's a restoration or other kind of project. So participation, any other hows do we do it? How do you 
get people actually interested? That's yeah. That's what I'm asking. I mean, that's a that's a major issue. It's been a major issue. And we're going to talk about. And I've got some case examples, but uh, right. How do you keep people interested? How do you get them interested? How do you get them interested? How do you keep them interested over term? Because restoration takes time. A lot of stuff takes time. So you get them really interested up front, and then you don't have a, a plan to keep it going. You, that's not involvement. Involvement is, an, is, is through time. And in Butte, you know, there was, if you look back, if you had a lens, you could see that there was some involvement at some areas at different places, but uh, a continuity of involvement, you know, came in and out. So how do you get them interested? And we're gonna, I'm going to ask questions about that to this group uh, for Butte, but maybe in general. So they have to see some benefit. They have to see some benefit. Thank you. They're like, well, why is this going to be important to me? And uh, that depends on the community. And that's why you got to do a, That's the first step of community involvement is that information sharing because you got to learn what is important to you. Well, in some cases, what's important to them, uh, you know, is something that you can, you can work on and capitalize and, and sell that community involvement. Uh, in other areas, you know, you really have to, to reach out and it ends up being a challenge. And here in Butte, there's a challenge, uh, especially getting some of our underserved populations engaged because they don't see, the, maybe they need uh, more information on why it affects them personally. And I'll, I'm going to give you an example of uh, in Ghana coming up about a time when we needed to reach women in West Africa in, in our, our communities because there were half of the population, half the community that we wanted to reach, but they were not participating. And we were asking ourselves that very question. How do we get them involved and, and how do we make it meaningful for them? And oftentimes that talk, talking to that community and doing an assessment. Okay, what do you think is important? Do you think health is important? Usually that's a tie with the contamination in Butte. Well, if you think personal health and community health and environmental health are important, you should probably pay attention to what's going on with Superfund in Butte. In Ghana, do you need fuel wood? And you're, walk, you're, you're spending two, three hours a day to look for the fuel wood for your family to, to make sure that the food is cooked? Okay, well, we can, th there might be an opportunity in a tree planting project uh, to make it relevant to their interests. Okay, so participa participation, putting it in their interests, which again we talked about, involves identifying those interests. Anything else, any other hows, how we can get people involved? I think that you're going to need to tell people what's going on, but they're not when to expect the full effect right. of what you have done. Right. Because plant communities take time to grow and change. And I, I love this analogy that we're making here because so do people communities. Take time to change, adapt. Modify and in Butte here, we're talking about decades of, of issues. In others, maybe it's short term, it's a, like a project scale. Sure. And then again, in each one, make sure that you're reaching everybody because you think you get four or five or six communities, you think you have everybody, you conduct an outreach session, like a public meeting on Monday night, and invariably somebody's going to crank because they, they weren't involved or they weren't engaged. So you also, there's got to be this learning project as that plant communities and people communities you know, evolve over, over time, you've got to make sure that you're tracking along with it, you know, all the way down. So, uh, you know, that's just in an overview. When you share information, there's a philosophy that I have to make sure that it's robust. And I, I call this information resiliency, and it, it goes to engagement, community involvement, resiliency. And the first is you have to have information available. Right now you have information in your minds, I have information in my mind. I'm making, and there, it's available, it's right there. Uh, if you put it on a website, you put it in a fact sheet, it's available. You put it at CTEX uh, Center downtown, it's available. You need to have that be information to be available before you start anything else, and you have to be able to have access to that. Uh, if you, people don't ha have a computer, they can't get on your web page and download something. If people are illiterate, they can't read a book or, or read the highlights in a fact sheet. So you've got to understand your audience, you've got to understand your communities through community involvement to be able to assess you know, how they're going to receive information. That's an important characteristic of, of community involvement. But just because you have those, those two, that's not enough. Because they, we, if you have information availability, you have access to information, we want to take it a step further and have them be able to use that information. Now in Butte, maybe that's being able to provide a public comment when there's a proposed plan related to the Superfund. 
Maybe it's a behavior change in a family to know about the contamination in Butte and, and household practices that you can do to minimize your exposure to contamination. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and call this up. Are there any other questions right out of the gate? Because I, I want to talk about the, uh, one more step of uh, preparedness or uh, information and sharing information, availability, access, and then being able to use that information. But again, it goes back to the third step is that's all fine and dandy when one person's in office or somebody's on the job or you have some dynamic leader. But to be able to make it sustainable beyond one person, and Imbued is a perfect example of the importance of doing that. How to empower and build the capacity of others and community involvement. Build the capacity of others to keep that torch going over time because restoration takes time, development takes time. <laughs> so really those four points and then in that you're able to assess the needs, the priorities, you're able to determine what's important and you're able to frame the development issue, the restoration issue to that specific audience and community. I'll briefly just run through some, some pictures here uh, that I brought. So my, in my experience, as a, uh, in the Peace Corps, one of the first restoration projects I worked on was a soil restoration and forest restoration. <coughs> the, uh, the disaster here was uh, colon colonialization. Uh, the deforestation that happened uh, really stripped uh, former almost tropical areas to a point where they, there's desertification. And uh, it, there was no way we could restore native forests right out of the gate because the soil had been depleted so much. So the strategy was to, in a way, mimic uh, secondary succession, build the soil resources first, and to, to get them to a certain point that eventually maybe native trees could be planted. And we knew that took time. And we took generations of volunteers to do that because to, even if you're planting quick growing nitrogen fixing trees like we are doing in West Africa, it's got to take time to build the soil before you can even begin to plant this tree and then this plant and this plant and these plant communities as they go along. So we're talking about local communities of people stewarding you know, a secondary succession of plant communities. And I was talking about uh, you know, one of the challenges was getting women to be involved, which was uh, we had assessed to be an important factor and they were an underserved community. Everybody here is low income. People here are living without running water. They're living without electricity. They are using this fuel wood literally to have a small little fire in, their in one of their huts and that's usually constructed of, of mud, bricks, and straw uh, to burn it. And again, these guys would go out for a long time. We ended up talking with this target community, identifying what they were doing and, and, and seeing how we could get involved. And one of the things that we engineered, and this is my uh, Ghanaian team in Kulingungu, West, uh, Ghana, was to start alley cropping as a, a means that they could plant. And if you look in that, you'll see the Glera City and Lucina trees just popping open. And these, these trees can actually produce this level of fuel wood in two to three years while fixing soil. Now they're non-native, so they take some management. But alley cropping is, well, it's great to plant forests, but that was cleared for a reason at one point because you need that for agricultural value. Alley cropping allows you to uh, plant trees in a matter that is, you can plant some understory of crops and then eventually use that as fuel wood. And the idea was this would be a, a woman's project. They would start having in three to five and especially to ten years a local source of fuel wood that they had owned and had uh, a stake in because how do you get them involved? Well, this will save you time that you can lend to your family. Uh, this will give you a, an, one of the most important commodities there, firewood. And uh, we, you can be in, and, and, and so they, they knew it mentally. And then we got them involved physically actually planting the seedlings. So they were involved physically in this process to plant that, to soil the, uh, uh, begin the uh, soil restoration and then eventually so we could work on some of the plant species or and tree species. So I came back, I was a volunteer in the 90s, late 90s, I came back uh, 2009 to 2011 as uh, what's called the director of programming and training and, and helped organize the, the volunteers. And one of the things we do in plant communities, especially restoration, you don't get short-term success. You can't say, here it is, see and give them a product. Some people like to see products or else, again, they'll go, it's not in my interest, I don't see it. And when, when, I, when we returned, we saw a lot of our big trees all around. But they didn't notice it because they grew up slowly with it. So 
The restoration project was still going on. We were able to get that sustainability as a viable kind of local business, this kind of uh, fencing sharing project. And it was ongoing, so I met with the chief and his council. Uh, this is the, uh, the Kusasi tribe and showed them, look, well, look, here are the conditions before, here are the conditions afterwards. And this was helped me motivate them again to double down on this project because they could see, okay, it is, it can happen and I want to be a part of that. And we followed up with some of the, uh, the women and you know, saw that they were harvesting those. So it's important obviously in community involvement, not just to monitor and evaluate the restoration project, but monitor and evaluate the community involvement project as well. And that's what we were doing here. In Vanuatu, Vanuatu is a small set of islands in between Fiji and Australia. So this is literally on the other side of the planet of, of Ghana, West Africa, which is basically at the intersection of the equator and the prime meridian. We, weren't, we were uh, doing, uh, it was another development project, and in this case there was a marine restoration project that we worked. Volunteers would work in different communities throughout the archipelago. They would go in and do community involvement, and they'd say, hey, well, what's important to you? Well, fish is critical to our livelihoods. And uh, what are impacts to fish? Well, reef degradation. Again, post-colonial uh, challenges, natural, re uh, natural uh, disaster problems. Vanuatu is famed for lots of things. One of it, it re receives the most natural disasters than any other country just because of their location. So there's earthquakes, there's hurricanes, there's everything there. And it uh, wrecks the reef. And so does development wrecks the reef. So they wanted to get in there and conserve the reefs that they had, but also start to restore. When you think of restoration and planting, we think about putting in grass, trees in the ground, and y using a nursery. Well, you can plant coral reef too. It just kind of comes on a small little ceramic chip with a small little piece and it seeds the reef. And you can actually, and this is what's important because this is habitat for the fish. We had to get the local people involved. And so Reef Check is an international effort to check reefs, but Reef Check in Vanuatu involved the community, the local community, say, hey, if you want more uh, fish resources, you've got to protect this reef, you've got to replant this reef, you've got to monitor and evaluate this reef, we're going to teach you how, we're going to build that capacity, and uh, here we are with some underwater equipment uh, doing just that. Uh, also in Vanuatu, it was, it was interesting, as we started our community involvement uh, and started talking to communities, <coughs> coastal communities, because you think reefs, coastal communities, you know, a communi uh, community of place again. We are, and, and doing information sharing, you know, good practices on how to protect the beach, how to do safe practices, how to set up marine conservation areas and how to plant and how to monitor and evaluate, but also what are some of the other threats? Well, something that we found was impacts to the reef wasn't just happening there, it was happening way up the mountain. And this picture kind of shows as they have bush paths. Here you can see it's a super highway of sediment to freshwater resources that would deliver this sediment to the coral reef. It lands on the coral reef, it reduces its availability to sunlight, an important nutrient, and you'd have reef degradation. So part of the solution, we learned that through community involvement, and part of the solution was another community involvement at that higher tier to start working with the Nivanawatu upstream to start uh, how can we design bush paths, new bungalows as tourism is increasing, uh, the need for expanding your agriculture? How can we state, make sure that we keep the slope stable and where there is uh, degradation, how, do, how can we protect those? And we used biotechnical engineering, which is a really fancy way of saying you use local resources to do that. And, you know, fallen coconut trees, uh, native uh, strategic planting of native grasses and some of the vines that are known with their root systems to stabilize slopes. Uh, sticks, brambles, and then behavior change. Community involvement, like how can you change your behaviors to protect your slope? So if you're seeing a bush path like this, what do you need to do? Well, we need to build the capacity of the chief, the local community to understand that there's a better way to go up uh, the hill. And so that's what you see here, volunteers uh, working together with, with the Nivanawatu, moving some sticks. So um, here's another project in California where we're with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Obviously, the natural resources was, was wildlife, but a big part of the wildlife uh, conservation was wildlife habitat. And not only, so it, we always had this, you know, avoid any impacts to the natural resource as you can. Reduce any impacts if you have to have it and then mitigate it to as much as possible. And the restoration of vernal pools was a part of that uh, mitigation. Now this took 
uh, an interesting level, uh, uh, you know, in the U.S. and California of community involvement because we had to have local agencies, elected officials. We had to have landowners. And you know how private landowners in California are happy to be working with the federal government. <laughs> so there's some challenges. There were some challenges there. And, uh, you know, uh, conservation groups to find those vernal pools and make it in their best interest to keep them. Conservation banks, hey, if you don't develop this, you're, you can have an offset through your taxes or through uh, 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 conservation credits. You know, try to make it in their be best interest. And if they have land suitable, so again, this is really looking for a specific community, land suitable for vernal pools. Uh, because through development in California over the last 200 years, a lot of those vernal pools were just completely wiped out. Important for migratory birds, a variety of aquatic system, and the uh, f uh, federally uh, protected vernal pool fairy shrimp. And I wish I had a picture of the vernal pool fairy shrimp, but it's basically a, a sea monkey. Does anybody remember sea monkeys? Vernal pool fairy shrimp. And so here's some communities working together, some landowners, some elected officials, uh, agency folks, and trying to, uh, and looking at a vernal pool and discussing ways to get involved more people into this program. Now in Montana, currently with the EPA, community involvement is different. It's every different because essentially that first step in involvement is listening to what the problems are and then identifying the issues and then working together to move forward. And here's two, so this is Betsy Burns. She's our remedial program ma project manager for our East Helena site where ASARCO had a, uh, a smelting facility and uh, created some serious uh, environmental uh, issues with the contamination. And uh, specifically, they want to restore Prickly Pear Creek that went through the former Asarco site. So she's talking to stakeholders, uh, local landowners, the local schools, uh, and offering PowerPoints to, to share that information and then collect that information as well. And here, uh, just out in Frenchtown, Montana, is the Smurfit Stone Mill site. It's not listed currently as a Superfund site, but it has been proposed. And they're in the process of their, I, would, I assume everybody here knows, remedial investigation feasibility study with the Superfund process. So they're just in phase one of that. They've got some preliminary results, and so there is that outreach, keeping people informed, number one. Number two, making sure that they have access to that information, and if there's any barriers to that, what is it? And in Superfund, it's, uh, you know, the language itself is, bar is a barrier. The volumes and volumes and volumes of data is impenetrable. And not only that, the engineering and science and legalese uh, is, in some, in, to some people, impenetrable. So we've got to get out there. We've got to make that information, make sure they have access to that, and then move towards that engagement. Get that, get that feedback, whatever, whether it's a public comment or a good idea, and then you know, make sure that that lasts over time. And so that was just last week. And I think my last, my last slide here is uh, Betsy Burns with... Uh, you know, a few people there on the slag. Has anybody been to East Helena? So here's a slag pile. Here's a Prickly Pear Creek that they're going to begin to engineer here off to the side. And this is a big evapotranspirative cover uh, that's uh, uh, going to cap the waste left in place there. Uh, so, you know, one other, and Dr. Powell, you can go ahead and turn off the overhead if you'd like. Oh, yeah. So another. Uh, short-term community involvement project that I want to bring to your attention and hopefully we can transition this to opening it up to questions is a uh, being in Butte I, I learned a lot of issues uh, Dr. Dr. Ray has told me several issues on more than one occasion uh, and I value that and he represents a community and every you know you've got to think of what communities of place do you represent what communities of identity and of value do you represent? And where should you engage? You know, one of the things we identified, and, and, and Joe Griffin is here too, and extremely helpful in, in getting me at least through the assessment phase of community involvement, because uh, in Butte, we're gonna, it's, we want to build something that's sustainable and, and genuine. And we're, we're not there yet. And, and Joe has been instrumental in, in showing me some issues. And one of the things I learned from Joe, who represents several communities. He represents a community of place. He lives here. He represents almost an agency. He represents CTEC, which is a local environmental group here. <laughs> well, I mean, because you were with Montana Department of Environmental Quality. You're no longer, so you don't officially, but I, we're taking that wisdom still moving forward, aren't we? 
I'm tapping into that in my community involvement. I'm listening to Joe. He's got a lot of issues. One of them is protection of caps of waste left in place throughout Butte. Area of concern. These caps are really important because uh, they help protect human health from environmental exposures. It's a pathway, this environmental contamination at certain levels, you know, with a pathway to the human can cause uh, lead poisoning and, and other kinds of uh, health risks. And risk to the environment. If there's a big stormwater in bed, you're going to get this contamination, you know, go to Silver Bowl Creek. So we need to cap this and make sure that it doesn't happen. Well, there's issues on the stability of these caps, the protectiveness of these caps. And uh, so we're looking at that, these protectives, yeah, we need to do things to make sure that we get all caps that, are, that go in from now on are going in in a, a good way. Any caps that are existing now, we need to monitor and evaluate them. And any caps that need improvement, we need to get those improved and stable and, and safe. And we have to involve communities to do it and let them know what's going on and let us know which ones are in priority and how we can do that. Well, Joe and uh, has a relationship with Dr. Powell, and I met Dr. Powell not too long ago. Dr. Powell is an expert on native plants, specifically, and how they can stabilize uh, certain soils. And they can have a little bit more resiliency, so not a community resiliency of community involvement, but actually a plant community of resiliency. Because the more these native plants can stabilize these and require less maintenance, you know, the more protective they will be. And so what one of the community involvement actions was to meet with Joe, representing SeaTech at the time, Butte Silver Bow County, who manages the CAP uh, assessment and protection system. The state of Montana, who is a key uh, player here, and Department of Environmental Quality, and, re and involve uh, Dr. Powell with and access his local, uh, his scientific e expertise. And the natural resource damage. And the natural resource damage, and I'm sure there's going to be more. They were, they were at that. They were at the, yeah, that's right. So thank you, thank you. Um, and, and again, so there, there's just one like small effort in a comprehensive way that hopefully we're addressing one issue through community involvement. So, and that brings me to this. Right now I've shared information with you. You've shared some information with me, but I hope, to, I hope that you can share more. And I'm, I'm listening to you, to you and hopefully that you'll provide some, uh, some guidance to me on maybe how we can reach people in Butte. You're living in Butte now. You have a sense of place here, so you're a community of place now. How many expect you live the rest of your lives in Butte? Raise your hand. How many expect to leave Butte at, uh, at some time and perhaps not, never return? Okay, all right, all right. There's a lot of undecided voters in this room. <laughs> Okay, so we want to access that as a community because what we learn from one community can be happy at the same time another community is not going to be happy. And you're never going to make everybody happy. So you provide a very good, refreshing, academic perspective on some of the issues here in Butte. So I have some questions for me, but I went through a lot of stuff, so I want to see if there's any uh, questions that you guys have for, for me. Principal, thank you. Here we go. <laughs> Let's start it up. Yeah, Joe? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Robert. And, and uh, actually, I would say um, you have been a breath of fresh air from EPA to this community. Um, Thanks. And you, you've definitely got your work cut out for you because EPA has lost a lot of trust here. But um, I, I guess one of the things, this is sort of a comment that I'm going to try and turn into a question. <laughs> Eventually, so. <laughs> okay, I just want to warn you right up front, Joe. Yes. I talk to you a lot. I don't, I don't get to talk to these students very often, so let's give them some time. So, so hit I'll, me with I'll it. Make it. I'll try to make this real quick. A little community involvement challenge that I got to manage on the fly here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so um, I guess what you know, you're asking, how do you engage a community? And the problem here is, although you get pretended to engage the community, they have, and we have. A couple of vehicles here which could have been used much better and I wish would be used in the present better. One of them is SeaTech, where we could provide people with technical backgrounds, not just normal. You mentioned the vast array of documentation out there, but we at SeaTech have people that can digest that stuff and provide input. Um, I would say it would be helpful if they could actually be engaged in the real technical discussion. 
Um, and I would take that even more importantly, I think, um, is the program here at Tech, which I think will be crucial in the long run, is to have this restoration ecology program at Tech um, a viable part of the remedy. Now, we use these terms remedy and restoration. Some people would think maybe those are interchangeable, but it really depends on restorations paid by money from the state of Montana and remedy is paid for by ARCO. And this program has to have a part of that ARCO money because this program should be part of a permanent program. So I would ask you, how do you, how do you see EPA actually reaching that level of engagement with this community, CTEC and Restoration Ecology Program? Okay, thanks. Long, long question. Sure. Uh, well, you know, I've, just, I've been with EPA for a year now. My family and I just came from, from California. Back home, I was born and raised in Montana. I love, love my state. Uh, and I love to serve here as much as I can. And there's no greater area where I think uh, I might come in handy than EPA and, and Butte. But it's going to take some time. And in my first year, was largely, I, mean, I just got out of my first year so I can si shift it into second gear. And that's what I'm looking to do this next year in 2017. Because 2016, the first thing I did is I sat with uh, every single meeting of CTEC, every, every monthly meeting since I got here. I met with you numerous times off, offline, took tours with you, uh, met with Dr. Ray numerous times, listened. Listening, assessing, what are the problems, where are people upset, and, and it's a complex, tangled mess right now. I mean, we're going to take short wins where we can, there's short hanging fruits like the Dr. Powell collaboration. There is some things that we can do in the short term, but building trust is going to take time. Like nurturing a, a plant community, nurturing relationships between communities is going to take time, and I know that. And we're going to work collaboratively as, as possible together. So bringing CTEC more into the loop. Ensure EPA has a public involvement, has resources to encourage public involvement, especially by other groups because we know we only have a certain capacity. EPA, we only have a certain authority. And uh, you know, there's a lot of expectations that we do that, and so what we do is we provide CTEC with a technical assistance grant. And this program, and it's used around the country, is used to give uh, up to $50,000 to a local group like CTEC to hire a technical advisor to take that volume of information, translate it in a manner that it can be shareable and understandable and accessible to the community. So we've, we've improved in some areas there. Now, I'm also listening to you, and I've, I've, I've heard this before, and I want to make sure that we also give that. I'm creating linkages externally to internally. Because you know, I'm, we're just repaving some of the communication channels, and to make sure that Robert Powell's program, funding through Remedy, all of that, at least those notion, notions are heard and understood by our decision makers so that they have access to that information and then they can take that, they can utilize that information hopefully in decision making. And that's going to take some time. And sometimes you can foster all the linkages you want, but sometimes there's, there's positions, there's anger, there's lack of trust, and there's a lot of barriers to that. So here it's likely going to be slow. And I want to point out that there's really two eras of, of true engagement. There's quasi-engagement and there's genuine engagement. Quasi-engagement is similar to what I'm doing now. You guys are engaged, and I'm going to tell you exactly when, where, and how you're going to engage, because I'm going to ask you specific questions. Not that genuine. On the other end of the spectrum is genuine. You decide how you're going to engage. You decide you're a part of the process, because you've got time, you've got restrictions. One of the big restrictions to community involvement is time, people's time. A low-income community, sometimes both Every member of the household, including the kids, are, are working multiple shifts and their time availability is what we have to know. And so we've got to bring a lot of people in the discussion to know that. So long answer to uh, your question. Good answer, Rob. Thanks. Good answer. Good answer. Yep. So other than CTEC, what if any local communities are you working with? So imagine Butte Resource Center. 
is a, a, another uh, program that we hope to continue to build tides. They recently joined the board of SeaTech, so that was convenient for us. Restore a Creek Coalition is a local group looking to restore a creek. So similar to what we accomplished in Prickly Pear Creek in East Helena is a vision of a local community and they have done extensive community involvement. So as a community involvement coordinator, what I can do is I can attend that group and I've attended most of their meetings uh, this year. And uh, I've also helped by creating linkages, external linkages from Restore Our Creek to not only my staff, my leadership in the Hel Helena office, but also our regional leadership in Denver to say, hey, this is going on, this is important, we should be listening, and was able to use some leverage and some local support to get our regional administrator out here, not once to visit this group, but coming again November 3rd or 4th, I believe, to meet with this group so they can unveil their vision. So getting in part, uh, that's another group that we get uh, uh, involved with. Uh, the Clark Fork Watershed Education Program, CFWEP, uh, they're the ones who uh, implement a lot of the uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation of these CAPs, but they do so much more and they reach high school students and Joe is rounding them up again for their next uh, annual outreach to Butte High School so these schools can bring these students all to different stations and better know the restoration and remediation we're going. Today. Oh, was it today? That happened today. Okay, so it happened today. There's, there's another example. So we want to make sure that we foster all of that because ultimately there's, you know the 80-20 rule? Everybody familiar with that? 80-20 rule. So we, and sometimes you end up spending 80% of your time on 20% of the people and sometimes there's a 95 to 5% rule. So we got to see where we're at and where we're effective and we got to evaluate that effectiveness. We got to see where we're not at and how we can evaluate our effectiveness to better reach those areas. And so we don't have an 80-20 Well, We have a, a uh, and Dr. Ray let me know the importance of this term between equality and equitable outreach strategies to make sure that everybody, we have this uh, equal, uh, this equitable outreach strategy so that we're reaching all people uh, equitably, which means different in different areas. I mean, I can publish a notice in the newspaper and I have recently at a public meeting on Monday, put in a notice in the paper and in, in the, uh, in a local paper, I'll just say, and a reporter from that local paper called me and said, after we had published the notice, hey, is there a public meeting coming up? So, okay, I just learned community involvement. Uh, I, you know, there's got to be something that they, they don't even, you know, interagency, they don't even communicate. So, you know, well, we got to overcome that. Any oh, other questions? Just a quick question. Sure. What are vernal pools? Great. Vernal pools are like wetlands. Okay. So I worked with Natural Resources Conservation Service here in Montana a few years ago out of their Bozeman, Bozeman office. They have a wetlands reserve program that talks about conserving, protecting, and rebuilding wetlands. And in California, they, they kind of had the same thing. So a vernal pool, they call it a spring, vernal spring, because it's more of a puddle that dries up, whereas wetlands sometimes here stay year-round. These dry up and these fascinating creatures, you know, go into a, a state of being and they can last that way. It's almost like a seed. They can last that way for hundreds of years, uh, but they require this inundation, this very specific soil type uh, in order to be able to have its life cycle. And once it's, you know, you bulldoze, scrape it, you know, you, you, they're gone forever. Yeah. Um, I've read that, I mean, the, the EPA has a problem with community involvement, I think, not just in view, but in many other places. Is Nationwide. This like, <laughs> is, this, uh, is this like a new um, approach that EPA is taking or, or that you're hmm. doing here? Or? We have, there are community involvement coordinators on the Superfund side. So EPA, they do clean water, they do clean air, they do a variety of, and they have public affairs specialists and they have community involvement coordinators. And they've had these positions, you know, since the inception, I think, what, 35 years ago, 40 years ago when EPA started, uh, especially with the CERCLA Act. So what we're doing here in Butte is, you know, going to be some, is going to be something different because, you know, there's just a, our office didn't have community involvement coordinators for, for Montana. They were out of the Denver office. And in the Denver office, you know, they have, uh, they cover five states, I believe. And there was, has been nothing in the uh, Montana office for years. So really what's new here is what's old. They brought, they hired me and I was happy to come back to Montana and take on the challenge and to come here and, and, and look at it. And again, my first stage was to assess what's going on, where our resources, what kind of, how, how are people involved and, uh, you know, to take the next steps. And we have varying degrees of success in doing that. 
And, and, and I think there'll be new programs, and I try to keep a, the community abreast of them when they happen. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Please excuse my ignorance. I just retired here. <laughs> I'm trying to polish my apathy, but I find this all interesting. Um, doesn't EPA produce like a one year or five year plan on what they're going to do with like a super fun stuff like that? Submit it to the public <laughs> and for comment and pull the comments back in and incorporate them. Yes. And sauce and blow is what you say. Yeah, I mean, okay. in a nutshell, that's, yes, yeah, they that's do. That's kind of how it works. Yeah. I guess my next question, I'm not really familiar with the CTAC. Community technical, technical. Thank you. Okay. Now, you get, <coughs> you get the funding from EPA to support this oversight? Uh, well, to, not their, uh, there's no over, like, oversight necessarily, but they get funding to support okay. their community. Yeah. Technical support? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, do do you guys contract specialists in the technical areas that are needed and provide comment? Back? Yeah. Yeah. That's been okay. that's been that's the whole idea. Okay. Yeah. That's so we're seeing probably a good pretty good back and forth. Maybe not a lot. No. Right now, the the relationship is still on the uh, improvement <laughs> swing here. <laughs> Did I characterize that accurately? Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's getting better. And I, I assess, so when I go there, again, assessing not only the project, but also the community involvement is important. And although my initial assessment okay. was, was clear, a year afterwards, I've, I've asked CTEC and the board of CTEC during their meetings, have you seen some improvement? Have you seen, and there's two members of CTEC here tonight, and I'll ask them again, have you seen some you know, initial movement, at least in the right direction? Yeah. Okay. Dr. Ray? So there's a healthy relationship. <laughs> we're building, we're building trust. We're, we're building trust. I worked, worked in the industry and, and commercial military, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we we put out a we signed a contract. Yep. So we got a straight line in the sand. Yep. But by the time we get done, it looks like a lightning bolt. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, and there's lots of lightning bolts here in Butte, and and really quick for the for Superfund in Butte. We're, this is late in the game. I mean, Superfund's been here for decades now, and so, so has CTEC, and so has some of these other games. And a lot of the community engagement, you talk about decisions, are, are to help make decisions. And there are decisions to be made. There are different level of decisions. That's something that might come out in like what's called a record of decision. Yeah. And the most recent record of decision for one of the operable units was, was several years ago, Butte Priority Soils. And in that, that kind of lays out the strategy and the approach to, to cleanup. And then now decisions are being made on you know, who does what, how to do it, getting that technical precise done. And that's where we need community involvement here. And that's what Joe was talking about, that scientific community involvement. Um, yeah? Okay. I, was just I don't know if we have time, Dr. Ray. It depends on your question. <laughs> this would be an easy one. The models that you gave from Ghana and Vanuatu, the people in the area were actually involved in doing the remediation and the restoration. They were hands-on. I'm wondering how applicable those models are to Superfund, where it's top-down with the agency deciding what to do, hiring contractors who come in and do it. Uh, and so I'm just wondering about the applicability of the models that you presented in, uh, from sure. uh, Vanuatu and sure. uh, Ghana for here. I mean, local people can't do remediation work. They don't remediate their own property. They sit back and right. watch mm -hmm. people come in with hoses and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they could do their own remediation work even. Mm -hmm. uh, and so aren't you set up, setting up a situation where it's always going to be the people up here, the agency or whatever, talking, not metaphorically, but talking down to citizens, this is what's going to be done. Yeah. We are going to do it to right. you or for you. <laughs> right. And so built into it mm -hmm. are problems of efficacy of yep. community involvement. Yep. Community involvement is supposed to shape decisions, mm -hmm. but isn't the model of Superfund preclude that? Now that top-down model is an organizational structure with uh, EPA and a lot of corporations and academic institutions, and it exists here, and we use it, and we use it to, to again, 
those four pillars of, of engagement with starting with information sharing and information availability. And uh, so there is that. But we're trying to, we're, we're, we want to diversify our portfolio. So for example, here's an example of community involvement that's not top-down EPA, that's a little bit more local up and it's a really effective, crucial part of the remedy here in Butte and that is the uh, residential metals abatement program. The community is engaging in that. They're involved in that by getting their blood tested. They're involved in that by saying, oh, I'm eligible for to have my house inspected or remediated. Yes, no, talk to my landlord. That's involvement. So, and that comes largely, we support Butte Silver Bowl for that level of involvement. You know, with CTEC is, is, is important and, and groups like that are important because it offers us an ability to get outside of that bureaucratic hierarchy and say, let's go ahead and build the capacity of a group, support it, that's independent and reflects the community, like CTEC. So that's involvement. Can we improve and, and increase the level that you move from quasi to genuine you know, in that direction? Absolutely. But it's very, you know, it's very complex here and the solutions are going to be very complex. And it starts with uh, small projects like getting, uh, getting Montana Tech and the Native Plants Program involved in the monitor or uh, in the uh, uh, stability of, of CAPS in, in Butte. And, and so, we, you know, that's decentralized, but we're not going to forget that we also have some abilities ourselves as a hierarchy to be able to disseminate information. And sometimes it comes across as we're the government and this is what we're going to say and here's our decisions. Uh, and, you know, there's ways to, to address that and, and we'll look to that, but there's also these other ways of, of getting people involved, building up partnerships and using partnership leverage. I can't, if I wanted to attract a, uh, an environmental justice community, for example, one of the ways to do that that I know very well, Dr. Ray talked about, you know, lessons learned from these other sites to bring it to Butte, uh, and I went to a Citizens for Labor and Environmental Justice, another group here that's, uh, that's active. Uh, is they, they offered food and people showed up because there's something that's in their interest, right? It really is. If, they, if somebody, I, when I was a starving college student, if I could skip a dinner, that helped in the long run, right? So being able to, but I don't have as an EPA, I am prohibited to purchasing, purchasing food for public consumption for very real liability issues. However, I might be able to work with Citizens for Labor and Environmental Justice, or CTEC, or in one of these other groups, and collaborate and make that happen so public engagement is more robust. So, you know, just another example of, of ways I hope that we, we move into. I, uh, it might be the only way to reach uh, a low income neighborhood is to canvas the neighborhood, old school, go door to door flyers, summary sheets. Yes, it's a great idea. I could do it in a day, but with 12. Montana Tech volunteers <laughs> on, a fr on a Saturday we're getting EPA volunteer credit could knock that out in a couple hours and you know get it done. So th those are the things that we're trying to get people involved and how something maybe I could get you uh, people like this community involved. Okay, we just got a couple more minutes. I know you guys' time is valuable. Uh, can, I, can I ask you guys some questions? Sure. You've been living in Butte for a while? Give me some f feedback. You know about EPA's challenges here. Any guidance, any recommendations, any solutions? Yeah. Have you heard of Rethink Butte? It's a community. It's on Facebook. They uh, recently just put together a cleanup project behind the M Hill. Do, we, do, do you guys know about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard yeah. about it. I okay. Have the chance okay. To Wait, what's it called? Rethink Butte. Okay. They have on their Facebook site, they have a drone video of the era before and they have pictures of after. Okay. And they organized a concert, so if you went up and cleaned, you could stick around for music. I just think that'd be a good Stick around yeah. for music. That, that's bringing in, making it worth people's while. Thank that. Thank you for that. Um, I'm assuming Silver so Oak Creek, they do water quality, well testing. We try to make people can mm -hmm. be aware, and then you watch for trends. That yeah. If you start exceeding, right? That, you know, yes. Like There's a whole partnership interagency approach to monitoring and evaluating the remedy here, okay. uh, including stream, water, groundwater, surface water, sediments. Air quality. Uh, air, air, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so you can see a, your 
Right. Yeah, yeah, and we get new data all the time, and that's important for involvement too, keeping that information sharing going. So, uh, EPA provides reports. One of the information repositories is CTEC Office. We do have a website, um, but there's kind of a logger jam right now. There's the information's available, and we're still working on to make sure that that's accessible. Uh, like I said, you can have it on a web page, but if somebody doesn't search the internet or have time, it's not accessible. So we've got that information and, and learning how to get, make that available to maybe the right immediate relevant audiences and kind of had a, a, a slow tiered um, outreach rollout. For example, here in Butte, we have a five year review that looks at all of that yeah, data. No. Oh, you didn't miss it. It just, it, we're just rolling it out. We're just rolling it out. In fact, we're working with CTEC. We're involving, community involving CTEC and EPA and other people to look at a summary document that takes the seven, five, 300 pages, 350 pages, into maybe 10 pages that's a little bit more understandable to read uh, so that we can use it. So yeah. kind of just uh, and, and be able to get that out there. So we'll have public meetings. I'll talk about it in places like this, but we'll have other meetings and stuff as we go down. And I guess you can make it where a layman like me can get out onto a website see a bar graft or some form of graft to see what right. quality, groundwater quality or is. Right, yes. But CTEC is basically getting that information now. It's, it's available with CTEC. They, they, they have access to it. You know, they have some challenges. They have some backlog too. You know, they, they had some, you know, support uh, a lapse in, in, in financial support uh, recently that curbed their ability to really get to a lot of that technical information. Uh, we've worked with them, I've, we, we heard, we listened, and we resolved that, so hopefully we can get that in. Yes, yeah, so when we get the summary fact sheet, our next step is to send that to the Butte City Council uh, and uh, Council of Ch uh, Commissioners make sure that they can read it and then come and present that to them. What we're trying to do is form an intergroup uh, outreach team that's represented by CTEC via Bill McGregor and your uh, engagement. Uh, myself, Jenny Flato, who's the my equivalent at the state level with the Montana Department of Environmental Quality, and representatives from Butte Silver Bow, and start to, uh, and that's kind of really the big the big start of the five year rollout is would be that uh, city, uh, uh, council meeting, and then after that get also their recommendations on how to get it out to the people they represent and some of these underserved communities. And I've already got, uh, received local commitments from different groups and individuals uh, to continue to, to work together to get that information out. It's the uh, University of Missoula, Bozeman, and, and here, Duke Tech. Are they kind of technically involved in some of the oversight or have the information available? That's what goes to Joe's uh, question. You know, they have the information okay. available and stuff. So, yeah. And, and remember, in Butte, we talk, we're talking about a timeline, the records of decisions uh, for you know, priority soils you know, happen there. So we're, we're along a timeline you know, where we're far from the beginning. Um, we've got a long ways to go, and it's taking a long time, and that's a frustration. But uh, we want to make sure that we, we increase that information availability, that input, because ultimately, with community involvement, the best that you can is going to help you address the environmental problem that you're looking at. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you in so many ways. It's going to give you buy-in. It's going to give you on-the-ground uh, intelligence on what needs to be done, what are the priorities, how to make it in people's interest, why is it, should it be meaningful for them, and uh, so, so you can have something effective. And in Butte, you know, it's symptomatic of, of 20 years of a degree of neglect. I think on, on uh, EPA's behalf and they recognize that and one of the first strategies they did is like, we need to get a CIC, that's my title, here in Montana and have them prioritize Butte. So I've been here a year and, and we're just moving forward. So again, I appreciate any guidance, any, any last minute thoughts or questions for me? Would it behoove you to go th through the people that are here and find out what their interests and, and uh, well, these are college students and class is over, so I'm not so sure. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to offer at the uh, back of the table my card. Um, I would love to know, if, especially if you're interested in engaging. You know, we might not be able to get you into the design of, of a future remedy for, for, for Butte, but um, there's all sorts of opportunities to be involved, whether it's canvassing a neighborhood, teaching people, building civic capacity, how to develop a, 
a community uh, had to develop a, a comment, a public comment. Uh, that's how agencies like mine get information from the public and process that and consider that to make decisions. Uh, all the way to uh, you know, planting trees or being a part of uh, education outreach to, to high schoolers. So there's lots of different ways. It's based upon your interest. I'd be happy to work from you. I especially would help, be helpful to me if I had any other guidance or wisdom or, or groups that might be out there that I can dial into to help uh, extend our reach as I move into my second year and more into an operational uh, capacity. Thank you very much, Thank you so much. Dr. Powell, everyone for coming.